asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Without further ado then, welcome back to the programme. Our friend, the former MI5 agent, the whistleblower uh, himself, uh, the great David Shaler, back on the programme this evening. David, welcome back. Thank you, Richie. Could you be back on the show? Thanks for coming back. Um, I don't know if you've been following it late this afternoon, but there was an extraordinary scene at Westminster where the Prime Minister initially said the police are still investigating, we've got to let them alone, we can't jump to conclusions. Then she said, well, it's got to be the Russians. Either the Russians, either the Russians did it themselves or they lost control of their own nerve agent and to make matters even more extraordinary what happened after that was a veritable who's who of UK politics stood up on the back benches to have their say after the Prime Minister's speech all of them telling each one succeeding the other with even more drastic horror stories about a- a- alleged misdeeds by the Russian state and Vladimir Putin I- extraordinary what are your thoughts David? Well, my first thought is obviously Putin's still getting up the nose of the Zionists, otherwise they wouldn't be doing this to him. Uh, that's my first thought. In some ways, it feels a bit like deja vu with the Litvinenko case, uh, where we've had this incredible pressure in Britain, leaking of stories and so on, to try and somehow prove Russian involvement. Uh, but there hasn't been... That, well, they've, they've found no actual evidence of, of Russian involvement in it. And again, at the time, I said on that case that this was more likely to be some kind of private security service, uh, possibly acting on the instructions of the Russian oligarchs. Uh, so I say, we, what we get in the mainstream media with politicians and mainstream journalists really is a kind of adolescent analysis of things. It's kind of rooted in this sort of Marxist idea of sort of so-called capitalism against so-called socialism. Uh, and the model, for, you know, that model died out 30 years ago in, in any real economic sense once that should take on the, the trade unions. Uh, what came after that, of course, was the, say, the ascendancy of these powers behind the scenes, Uh, And this is more of exactly the same thing. And this is why we can't trust the government. The government at the moment is having its strings pulled by some extremely evil people who will murder people with things like polonium-210 and sarin gas and uh, nerve gas if that's what suits their agenda, basically. These people are psychopaths. This is new, though, isn't it? In terms of... We'd have seen in the past, we would have seen backbenchers, we would have seen independent MPs standing up and saying in the interest of decency and honesty, none of this makes any sense, it doesn't add up, the police themselves are saying they're not sure exactly what happened, how can we be beating the war drum today in the manner that we are so it's new in that sense I mean I suppose the Tony Benz of this world are gone um, there was no dissenting voice whatsoever today, David. Well, we say that's a new development, but when I blew the whistle 20 years ago, that's exactly what happened to me. They they had a debate in Parliament, uh, without mentioning my name, but obviously referring to my disclosures shortly after I blew the whistle, but there was nobody there standing up for whistleblowers or standing up for me or anything else. Uh, in fact, I was in prison at the time. They used the opportunity in Parliament to... Uh, attack my character, and that came from you know all all different political parties. When they had no idea, of course, at that point, what I was truly blowing the whistle on, which was MI6 funding our terrorist enemies. Uh, and I say the very fact that we haven't had an inquiry into that has shown really where the leanings of the political class are. If it's in the interests of the elite to have a debate, they will maintain a debate. They'll maintain a stalemate. But if it's not in their interest to have a debate, they will make sure now that these. Politicians, I say, these people's understanding of the world is, is just it's not sophisticated because they are essentially ignorant fools uh, who have essentially been seduced uh, by lies that resonate with their egotism. Uh, I mean, we nearly had the Third World War started in Syria in 2013 with that the, the vote. That came very close to uh, trying to remove the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Um, and again, that, that didn't quite work for them. There was a saying, there was a bit of dissent there at least and stopped that. But uh, on the whole, you'd be surprised at how quickly Parliament, when it's something like war, it was a bit like with Afghanistan, 
uh, when I tried to get on platforms and slow people down before the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11 had happened, the same thing happened. You had unanimity amongst the political class, very little dissent. And, we, and that's really obviously where the problems all began with all of the stuff in the Middle East, which creates the refugee crisis. Uh, it's created the yeah. attack upon our rights. And they say the really basic rights of Western civilization, the right not to be in prison without trial, the right not to be tortured. So they there was dissent, oh my friend. The clock back. There was a little. I mean, there was dissent pre-invasion of Iraq in 2003. There was. You had people like Claire was, Short, yeah, and again, but, Robin again, Cook, and look others. Look what happened. Look what. Look what yeah. happened. You know, we had two, three Robin million Cook people murdered, on the yeah. streets. Yeah. And, and and they didn't. Um, you know, and it, it didn't work. And I think that was the point when a lot of reasonable, intelligent people parted company uh, with politics and the political class. Uh, I think I, I could certainly say, for me, it was the straw that broke the camel's back after, you know, 20 years of activism on and off to see the government's response in 2003 to so many of the people on the street showing their uh, opposition to the war being completely ignored and also being proved to be completely right as well. You know, they were vindicated by the events in Iraq. In fact, there were no weapons of mass destruction. The fact it destabilized uh, a region of the Middle East and caused all sorts of deaths and disease and everything else. And left a vacuum for the lunatic jihadis that they helped train. And you and I have talked about this so many times. Let me put something to you. Elites, wherever elites are, are elites full stop. And Russia has its elites. It has its oligarchs, its billionaires. Putin is one of them. Now, I'm going to preface this question by acknowledging that Putin is on the right side of the Syria argument. I'm going to acknowledge that he was right to do what he did in Crimea because of what Victoria Newland and uh, Yatsenyuk did in Ukraine and because the lies told to uh, one of his predecessors, Mikhail Gorbachev, after the wall came down, the lie being that NATO wouldn't take any further steps east. They've done all that. So Russia is being baited, it's being provoked. I accept all of that. Russia is not the enemy. However, it's got its own bad people, and maybe Putin is one of those, and maybe because Russia is on the defensive from NATO, surrounding it and all of that, maybe it does play the long game with defectors and with double agents, David. Maybe Putin did order this guy um, to be executed. And maybe, as horrible as it is, if he did do, maybe you could understand it. Uh, well, again, if you've, if you've worked behind the scenes, you'll know just how hard states work not to be blacklisted or sanctioned or whatever by having these, uh, by doing things like that or giving safe haven to terrorist groups. You know, a lot of, uh, for example, Saddam Hussein and Colonel Gaddafi acted as a break upon the, the, the groups who, who they uh, gave safe haven to and stopped them attacking the West. You've got to remember that factor. Uh, the Russians, of course, uh, are much more sophisticated. They played the Cold War as well. They, it, this would be an enormous risk. If it genuinely did get out and there was some really convincing proof of Russian involvement, uh, that really obviously then would be the excuse they would use for deterioration in relations with Russia. And Russia knows that they're being watched like hawks by the Zionists at the moment so they can exploit anything like that. So with my intelligence hat on, I think the idea the Russians did this is extremely, extremely unlikely. Uh, it's got all the hallmarks, I say, of something backed by by the Zionists and perhaps carried out by uh, elements, certainly, of the secret services, but probably in terms of the actual execution of the order, more likely by secret societies and private security firms. Uh, we shouldn't forget that in the case of Litvinenko uh, 12 years ago, uh, the first uh, traces of the Polonian 210 were traced to the offices of a private security firm called uh, Erinis. Um, and that really wasn't properly investigated further because it then started to be found all over the place. But anybody knows these people know how to work. They know how to confuse an investigation. And if you just then dip traces of Polonium 210 all over London, your defence can be, well, it was all over the place as well as in our offices. Um, so again, we, you know, <laughs> if we're actually investigating what is really going on and using proper forensic techniques rather than what we now have, which is the police essentially being political investigators and investigating people for harmless comments on Twitter, 
Uh, they've actually lost the art of, of genuine forensic investigation. So they're probably not in a great position to know one way or other about these things. But at the same time, obviously, I accept that the Zionists are past masters uh, at all forms of uh, deluding the public um, and all forms. And essentially what is conjuring on a grand scale, it's kind of black magic conjuring. Uh, they love nothing better than uh, completely fooling the public. They love nothing better than sending innocent people to their deaths because those are the kind of psychopaths they are. It's interesting. I, I wrote about Tom Tugendhat, the MP today, very inexperienced MP, who chairs the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee. And he got that job when he stood against the incumbent, uh, Crispin Blunt, last year. Now, Blunt was a marked oh, man. Yeah. Blunt was a marked man because his report highlighted the lies that the British government told about Libya. And also, Blunt was going after how Israeli diplomats were um, trying to ruin the careers of politicians in this country. So Blunt was was toast. So this guy has only been an MP for two years, but he's a rabid Zionist, Tom Tugendhat. He's a rabid Zionist. He's written for The Spectator about Israel. You know, it, nobody cares about the illegal settlements, he says. The UK shouldn't have endorsed the resolution, whatever it was, 2334, maybe, I can't remember, the one that condemned uh, the settlements back in late 2016. This guy's a rabid Zionist, and he's been banging the drum most loudly since last weekend for about eight days now that the Russians did it, the Russians did it. It's, it's amazing. And, of course, you talked about the media. We do not have a force of state. We don't have any semblance of a media, not even pockets of media, that will say, well, hang on a second. Um, let's start asking questions about those screaming the loudest. Let me ask you this, David. Is the proximity of Salisbury to the to the chemical weapons stockpile facility at Port and Downs, is that relevant at all? Is it worth investigating? Yeah, always the reverse investigating connection like that. Um, some of the older listeners will remember that I think it was about 20 years ago now that there was a spate of deaths of people connected with Port and Down. In fact, even David Kelly himself, although ostensibly it looks like he was assassinated for his knowledge of the lack of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, also had knowledge of what was going on at Port and Down. Uh, so that may be a factor in it. The fact that, I mean, they say it's happened near there. Uh, the fact that he's been associated with this. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that's got to be a line of investigation. Again, anybody who's uh, got a rational brain will know that is the position you take. Anything suspicious like that, you will follow that lead up until you can rule it out. You don't just ignore it and investigate things for political reasons according to your prejudices. There's loads of questions coming in for you, understandably, on this. And you might not, I mean, one of the things I've always admired about you, despite the things that happened to you, you've always maintained a level of, you say what you see and you claim what it is you can prove. And I've always admired that about speaking to you over the years. People are asking, are MI5, MI5 of course, charged with national security, uh, of course, MI6, international affairs, are these are all of these groups, whether it's Mossad, CIA, NSA, are they in the business of regularly just bumping people off? Is that what goes on on a on a month by month basis? Uh, I have to say that obviously in MI5, I never saw any evidence of them trying to bump people off. But when I worked with MI6, they briefed me on the operation to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi. Yeah. Uh, and again, the real reason for that was because Gaddafi nationalised the Libyan oil industry in 1976 at the expense of BP. All we have to understand is the intelligence services, particularly work, those working abroad, MI6, are really working in the interests of the oil industry and the banks. They're not working in the safety of the British people. Certainly, I know from my own investigations, uh, I've concluded there must be an element there working to a Zionist brief. Uh, and I came on this show last year and told you all about how uh, Tunworth, the, Tunworth. Uh, uh, the agent, the Islamic extremist who's been the go-between between, between MI6 and part of the Islamic fighting group, he is the father of Salman Abadi, the man they're blaming for the Manchester bombing last year when 22 people died, uh, many of them young girls. So we have MI6 connected to a terrorist attack in Britain. And at the very least, we can say you know, their, their expertise must have been used because it was a sophisticated device. But nevertheless, that has to be investigated further. How come MI6 have these connections? How come an MI6 agent is the father, which is going to be a close relationship with his son, uh, of a man 
who is supposed to have carried out a suicide bombing in Manchester. Uh, these things need to be properly investigated. Of course they do. And that investigation itself could act as a deterrent. Uh, it was a bit like when we had the exposure of uh, the phone hacking. The very start, as soon as that investigation began, it stopped the phone hacking because it became a deterrent. But because for the last 20 years, since I blew the whistle on MI6 funding Al-Qaeda, they've been given a free pass by Zionist sympathizing governments, they've come to the conclusion they're above the law and they can do as they please. Uh, now, obviously, they may not be brought to justice here, but I always say with my other hat on, uh, there is karma, and karma's coming for the people who've been on the wrong side. And obviously, if you've been on the side of war and torture and murder, you're clearly on the wrong side, and you're clearly going to be getting bad karma in the end times. You told me last year about Ramadan Abedi, Agent Tonworth. And That's the, right, yeah. The, it, was, it, was, it was extraordinary to listen to that. It was, I'm, I'm generally a decent listener anyway, I think, if I can give myself a little bit of credit, but I don't think I said a word for 15 minutes. And I took that YouTube video at the time. It doesn't exist anymore, sadly, but I still have the interviews on Podomatic and Spotify and elsewhere. But I took that interview and I sent it everywhere. Everywhere. I sent it to the BBC. I sent it to Channel 4, ITN. I sent it to LBC Radio and to the newsrooms of another six or seven commercial stations around the country. I introduced myself. I said, I'm a broadcaster. I'm well known in parts of my home country. I'm reasonably well known over here. I'm a real journalist with real qualifications. What David Shaler is saying is the absolute truth. I never got a response back. I never got so much as a thanks very much for that. We'll have a look into it. Nothing. Nothing. Well, say, this shows, doesn't it, the extent of, yeah. of where we are. That they've, in in terms of within the mainstream media and within Parliament, they've now essentially marginalised or abused or killed all the genuine refuseniks. This is why you say when you see in Parliament now they get up and support these things, uh, because all the people who've shown dissent, all the people who've stood up for the rights of man against the intelligence services, have in fact identified themselves, and the Zionists have then obviously tried to disrupt their lives or, say, in extreme cases, kill them. Uh, that's exactly how the Zionists operate. But so what we've got left now in the political class and the mainstream media are obviously the lowest common denominator, the people too stupid to think for themselves in any way. Uh, people who are in fact psychopaths by default. It's their genuine ignorance of, of what's going on in the world that makes them think they're doing good when they're doing evil. Uh, but that's no excuse. God says you do understand the world you live in. Uh, that's all part of it. So... That, that's not an excuse. Ignorance is no excuse in the, in the eyes of God and the law. But you know something about that ignorance? It's interesting we're talking about Zionism and the influence of Zionism in this country and elsewhere, everywhere really. I talk about it a lot and I know that friends of ours, um, Mark Windows and, and others, talk about it a lot, but talk about it factually. You know, we talked a lot last year about the politician Preeti Patel who had to leave her job as the Secretary for International Development because she took a holiday uh, and went to Israel <laughs> and, and spent time with the Israeli Prime Minister but neglected to tell the government that she was meeting on her holiday. But what's extraordinary yeah. about that is I reported back in... You talk about this being in plain sight. I reported back in early February that she'd, been, uh, she'd made it to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee so she has to, you know, leave her post at International Development Secretary because of meetings with the Zionists. She's caught out, red-handed. Apologies, I'll leave, no problems. And then they don't even wait a year. A couple of months later, she's on the Foreign Affairs yeah. Select Committee. It's a joke, it's David. It's in people's faces. She should have been investigated for treason under treason. The common law. This is, treason. Con this is obviously conspiring to defraud the British public, the British taxpayer, uh, with a foreign government without telling the home government. This is a classic example of treason. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else in any other country, well, l l forget any other country, if she had been meeting with, on her holiday, unknown to her boss, if she'd met with the Pakistanis or the or, 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 or the Sri Lankans or if she'd been in or Myanmar Russians. or the Russians, of course, uh, she, she'd, be, she, she'd, she'd, she'd probably have lost her, even her position as MP, there would have been a by-election. It's, it's, it's yeah, staggering no, stuff. 
Where are we going with this then, David? Where, I mean, they've obviously tried, convicted, and they're going to sentence Russia now. Where is this going to end up? Is there some sort of... Um, I mean, we talk about this with other researchers who research different things who believe that ultimately where this is meant to lead is into some sort of apocalyptic war involving... Uh, Go ahead. That's pretty much right, yeah. They, I don't know if you've been watching the financial news, but all sorts of big corporations are declaring losses, uh, possibly going into receivership. Um, so what's the, the financial collapse that I've been talking about, I mean, I've mean, i been saying it's going to come when they stop printing money, and we now appear to be at that part of the cycle. Uh, they haven't killed Bitcoin either. Their other plan was to try and float uh, another fiat currency, but one that they control. That hasn't worked because of Bitcoin. So they're, they're going back to try and start the Third World War again. <laughs> uh, and they're going for the traditional kind of more Cold War-y Russia approach. So that's where we are. They're trying to distract us from the fact that we're about to go into economic meltdown. The biggest bubble in history is about to explode. And none of us know what's going to happen in that circumstance. You know, we really don't know. Uh, and this is why I do keep making this plea to the government is, you know, talk to people who actually know what is going on in the world. Talk to people who have some insight into how we might be able to take all of this forward, basically, rather than people making the same mistakes over and over again. And of course, people who are profiting from that, you know, we need, we, we need to never forget that just about every journalist and MP in the political class these days is so rich, they don't have to work again. They don't have to do any of this stuff. Uh, and that, for most of us, is a luxury that we couldn't possibly imagine. You know, most of us, especially if we're involved in truth issues, are grubbing about an existence uh, on a day-to-day basis. Uh, so we've got to firstly take out the people, the, the politicians and so on, or multi-millionaires who are profiting from usury, because that's where the problem begins. Uh, we've got to stop paying our mortgages, stop paying our taxes to these people because they're psychopaths, they won't use them for any good. When you start doing things like that, then you really get the Zionists excited. Um, but what also I say to people as well is that, you know, we are coming through. This is all symptomatic of this great period of change that is predicted in many, many different world cultures. Uh, and I believe we've now got into the uh, final uh, half of the third day of the end time. So things are coming uh, where things are going to change rapidly on a different level. The age of politics, banking and everything else is over. And people need to get out of that now and start trying to square the karmic slate. Uh, because I know people think they might be able to go through a kind of last-minute repentance, but they might, that may, they may not have that opportunity. The repentance may take more than a minute or two. So uh, people need to start preparing for that right now. Interesting that the the collapse that you predict is coming. Again, many of our guests who... Well, so all the stuff's coming out. I've been talking about the Zionists and everything else, and it's not like it was 12 years ago when they... Uh, bombed Beirut and I first went onto the mainstream media and denounced Zionism uh, then the Zionists are very organised, that was obviously part of how they managed to turn the 9-11 truth movement against me and so on, there was no organised opposition to Zionism, very few people even knew what it was, now lots and lots of people know about what Zionism is, lots and lots of people have seen through their scam essentially and are not impressed with it and again, this is why I say it's a spiritual thing. If you're a political, you'd be scared to shit by the Zionists. But the truly spiritual being who says, no, you know, it's more important I stand up for the rights of those poor people in Palestine uh, and suffer some injury myself than it is to go along with that and uh, have to live with a bad conscience and eternity living in hell wondering why I made the wrong decision. It's interesting. Just before we finish on that, my friend and colleague, um, somebody who is very helpful to me, from time to time with um, information. Uh, Jean Ann Crowley, who's um, in, in uh, Connemara at the moment, has just um, sent me a message saying, you, as in me, Richie Allen, being a self-confessed atheist, if I recall, she says, means that you might be missing out, I might be missing out on the major debate, if she may venture to say so, which is evil versus good. Only no one reads the Bible any longer, unless they be religious fanatics but it is well worth serious uh, perusal she but, says that she's into the metaphysics of existence i've never paid any attention to uh, the bible but i'm not dismissive of people who do and there are a lot of people who have said to me in the past that they think um you, you, that i don't pay enough attention to the, the the genuine genuine metaphysical spiritual or cosmic battle between the forces of of good and evil. I don't because I'm a pragmatist, David. I can only I can only say what I see. What do you say but, to but that I before we finish up? Go ahead. 
But Richard, I, I do that because I'm a pragmatist as well. You know, that I really do believe in the same eternal battle of good and evil going on. And let's face it, in the end times, you're either on the side of love, law, and Jesus Christ, or you're not. You're on the side of something beginning with D and ending in evil. Uh, there's no neutrality in the war of good and evil. It's about living in love, but you don't have to necessarily believe in God as such. You say it's about love and showing consideration to your fellow human beings. It's about Doing the right uh, thing. coming to conclusions yourself through your own research and not being swayed by the mob. And so, you know, when I when I went through my awakening, it wasn't like I had to change my life. It was I'd been living by those values when I blew the whistle, when I stood up against war, when I tried to defend the oppressed, like people who had their, lost their children in, the, in Bloody Sunday in 1972 in Londonderry when the British Army gunned them down. Uh, all those kind of things, you know, I, 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 I have the opportunity to speak out and, and, and not have those things on my conscience, but that obviously caused all sorts of problems, but karmically much better that uh, than, than not. Doing the right thing or trying to do the right thing, which every one of us understands inherently. Um, I agree with that. I just want to give um, a shout out to David's website, bookofthelaw.org. That's bookofthelaw.org. Do uh, check it out there. Yeah. It's packed full of information. Give a quick, right? quick mention to my, my novel, The Organisation, and my book, The Law, which are both available on Amazon. If people could buy those, I can, that helps me basically get food to eat and things like that. Absolutely. Uh, when, well, when you get a chance, um, tweet those links out to me and I'll retweet them and put them on our Facebook page. In fact, I'll put them on the website as well. Uh, top man, brilliant, absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Rich. Yes, great. No, I don't one other thing I want to say as well is we just literally today I've kind of finished, uh, well, certainly a, a, almost a final version. Just going to do a little bit of polish and bells, but otherwise all there uh, on a documentary called The Life of Dave uh, that a director's been making about me, uh, which gives me the opportunity to probably have my say about things ranging, obviously, from MI6 funding Al Qaeda to. Uh, the physical impossibility of planes being used on 9-11 to Zionism, to spirituality and, and law. Uh, and it also features uh, parts of my life um, you know, from 2014 to, well, to 2017, basically. So that's coming out soon as well. So the other side, obviously, are going to be quite upset about that and uh, going to be probably coming after me again. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing it, mate. In the, in the meantime, I'll give you a shout in a few weeks' time when you're um, back on... Uh, the Skype uh, side of things, we'll, we'll get you back on for a longer segment. We'll have we'll have a chat about more of these issues. Thanks for your thoughts on the Sergei Skripal saga. I really appreciate that, David. Thanks a million. No problem. Thanks so much, Richie, once again. Thanks for being on the show. Love to everybody out there. Cheers, mate. Cheers, mate. Bye for now. David Shaler there, uh, live on uh, the show tonight, talking about Sergei Skripal and much more besides. Check out bookofthelaw.org when he sends those links over to the uh, Amazon. I can't do it now. Uh, or I'll do it later on. I will share them so you'll know where to get those books if you want to um, to uh, to check them out. Mm-hmm.